everybody, my name is Scott Waters and welcome to New Life to Metal. Uh, a lot of people are asking, what are you going to do the next top whatever year with Trog? Trog. And uh, honestly, I don't know. <laughs> we are working on 1984 and 1978 are the two videos we're planning on doing next. Um, but Trog and I don't live in the same state, so when we get together is when we get together and, and right now I don't have a plan for that. Uh, hopefully in the next couple months we'll be able to do that and get 1978 1984 kicked out. Or is 85? I don't know. Anyhow, the next two years we're going to do the next in the 80 series. Then we're going to go back and also do some of the 70 series. But um, many may not know, but we do a lot of preparation for those videos and we start them weeks and sometimes months in advance. And uh, we'll kick back and forth those lists through email. Um, trying to get it down to what we want it to be and you know include the bands we want to include and you know exclude the bands we want to exclude and it takes some time sometimes for us and uh, that's what we're working on right now on the 1978 list so I've been putting together that list and as I was doing it I discovered that I had a ton of Canadian bands that released albums in 78 that I really enjoy um, and thanks to several people from the vinyl community um, from Canada uh, in the last couple years since I've been part of this vinyl community I've discovered a ton of just great Canadian hard rock bands from the 70s and 80s that I enjoy. I'm already familiar with a lot of bands you know Triumph and Rush and whatnot uh, those bands are pretty popular here in the United States but I discovered a lot of stuff I didn't even know existed um, other than you know having read about it and perhaps uh, you know a book like uh, like this one which is Martin Popoff's collector's guide um, so it's great that I've been discovering some of these new bands. Um, you know, people like uh, Maria, uh, Greg the Egg, uh, Blackmore Rules, um, Captain Howdy, John uh, Hockley, um, Jax, Jex, J E X X, Jex, uh, Darren Hildebrandt, um, Brother Lee, Noise Spectrum, trying to think who else I know in Canada, uh, even Spud, who's unfortunately no longer making videos. Uh, tons of great guys in Canada in the BC. And uh, I've learned about a lot of great bands from those guys. So um, I found that it was a ton in 78. So I decided to do a top 10 Canadian hard rock releases of 1978. So that's what this video is going to be. Um, so I'm going to start off with two honorable mentions that almost made the list. Um, this is the Carroll Brothers. Honestly, I had no idea who these guys were until just recently. Um, apparently, they were a very well known, well liked local band. In, uh, I can't remember what area of Canada it was. I guess it doesn't matter. It's anyhow, Canada, wherever they're from. <laughs> um, and I guess they were really heavy live, put on a great show. Um, and even according to Martin Popoff's book that I just showed you, he talked about how great their live performance was and how heavy it was and, and how they he was they were just, you know, you'd go to one of their shows and, and, and would just like, your blood would get pumping. And uh, unfortunately, this album doesn't really reflect that from what I've read, you know. Um, but it's still a good, solid, hard rock, guitar-heavy, instrumental, uh, instrumental, guitar-heavy rock and roll record. Um, and this band is basically, it's a four-piece, but it's basically made up of three brothers and a keyboard player named Steve Ballison. Peter Carroll, Paul Carroll, and John Carroll. Uh, just solid, straight-up hard rock, good record. I'm kind of curious if they were that much better live, what the, um, what the, what they sounded like. Um, apparently, some of the songs that they did live that were real popular with their fans never even made it to vinyl, which is kind of curious, so, um, anyhow. Cool, Carol Brothers. Um, one that I like, but uh, it, it just hasn't like bowled me over yet. Um, it's not only you know uh, this record, but the, this band. Um, I just need to give them some more time and be in the right you know headspace for them. But uh, this band is uh, Street Heart. This being their 1978 album, obviously. Meanwhile, back in Paris, um, uh, three of the members of this out of this band on this album went on to be with uh, the band Loverboy, a band that I was never too fond of, um, very poppy, um, I kind of refer to them as sappy <laughs> uh, 80s rock, um, they were okay, they had some you know, decent songs, never one of my favorite bands, but Street Heart was a little more uh, straightforward hard rock, less keyboardy um, than Loverboy was, but uh, Paul Dean is in this band who is a vocals guitarist. Ken Spider, uh, what is his last name? See, it's on here somewhere. Sinov, I don't know how to say it, not bass. And then uh, Math Frenette on drums. Those three guys went on to be with April Wine. Uh, decent album. Hard Rock, Canada, 78. All right, so here we're going to start with our list. Number 10. This is a band that I really like. <laughs> Matter of fact, I'm wearing this shirt. Got two albums behind me. This is Moxie. So why is it number 10 and not up higher in the list? 
This is their fourth album, and I think it's much weaker than either of these two albums or even the third album that followed that. Um, it's just, uh, I don't know, I think that they were trying to please a larger crowd, so they got a little more commercial, a little less uh, raunchy rock and roll, which is what I kind of liked about that first record and then the second record as well. Um, funny thing is, this record too features a member of, um, his name on here, Mike Rynoski, who uh, went on to join Loverboy as well. Uh, Mike Reno was his name in the Loverboy. So, uh, yeah, not a bad record from them. Just not one of my, f my favorite of their albums. Uh, probably the least favorite of the four, the first four albums that they released. Moxie, Under the Lights, 1978. Uh, one that I'm kind of, one band that I, man, I was really into these guys last year. Bought up everything they put out and I still really enjoy them. Um, kind of a, Heavy rock, power pop bands. Um, this is uh, Trooper, um, Thick as Thieves, and this is not a super heavy album. Uh, their first album was probably their heaviest and their most rocking. I think a lot of bands started, especially the hard rock bands in the, in the late '70s and early '80s. They kind of suffered from identity crisis. They weren't sure what to do with their sound. Um, unlike a band like Judas Priest that embraced heavy metal and went with it, you know, a lot of these bands were like trying to do the radio hits as well as play hard rock. They're trying to please everybody and in the process please nobody, right? <laughs> um, but that's what you got with some of these bands. But So uh, I don't think this album is quite as good as their first album, but it, it is a very good album and I do really enjoy it. It's got several hits. Uh, let's see, we got Round and Round We Go, The Moment It Takes, and then the only song from this album that I was familiar with prior to hearing this whole album, um, which is uh, Raise a Little Hell. And the only reason I know that record is because um, for years I've been a, in a hockey fan and we uh, get Canada uh, Nights and Hockey, uh, Canada Hockey Night, whatever, on TV, and that is like a hockey barn staple, I guess, there, because I hear it all the time, it's called Raise a Little Hell, Raise a Little Hell, Raise a Little Hell, Raise a Little Hell, yeah, that song is on here, <laughs> um, yeah, it's a good record, uh, you know, not super heavy, um, kind of right along the lines of maybe, you know, like a Cheap Trick or, um, I don't know, some of the, some of the more rock and sticks material, um, commercial, poppy, but still guitar oriented rock and roll, still hard rock. I just wouldn't call it, you know, stepping towards metal. It's more of a step away from metal, is what it is. Uh, it's got two copies of it here. Uh, one's on yellow vinyl, one's on black vinyl. Um, very cool. Still looking for a replacement copy for the yellow one. The vinyl's fine, but I'm looking for one without this person's name on it. So, uh, T. Harrison, for some reason, decided to write his name on there three times. So, T. Harrison, I have your record. Thanks for writing your name on it. Appreciate it, dude. Uh, next up, this is number uh, what are you on, eight. Uh, I just showed this one in a video recently because it just arrived in the mail. Um, but like I said, I did have this one on CD. Glad to have it on vinyl. This is Zon, Astral Projector. Um, this is a uh, progressive pump rock is what I've always described them as. Um, somewhere, and I've said it before, sits somewhere between Queen and Styx. But honestly, it's just a little closer to Styx than Queen. <laughs> uh, not, quite, not quite that orchestral or, or pompy as, as Queen were. A um, little more straightforward than they were. Uh, a little, like I said, a little closer to Styx, but still a little heavier than Styx as well, more rocking. Um, definitely has that kind of, uh, I don't know, if other bands I put them in line with is like Angel on Stars and those kind of bands. Um, you know, power pop, I guess some people would describe it as, uh, but a little more progressive than some of that stuff. So, uh, like Angel was very progressive in their sound. A song like Tower is very progressive, and you get that with Zon as well. Astral Projector, 1978, picture of the band in the back. Zon. Uh, another band that I got heavily into, and last year when I was visiting Canada, I finished off my Max Webster collection. Um, I was looking for an upgrade copy of this, didn't find one, but I'm still keeping an eye out for one. But this is Max Webster Mutiny uh, up my sleeve. Um, when I was out in Canada you know, last year, about a year ago from now, uh, I was um, buying up every Max Webster album I could find. Apparently they're really common up there. They are not real common here in the United States. Um, they never were real popular here in the United States. I don't even know that they ever had a hit in the United States. Um, but I really dig them. Now this album is another one of those albums I think was suffering a little bit from identity crisis. You know, there wasn't, they were just all over the board musically. You know, at one song, at one point they would be doing a straightforward heavy rocker. Next next one is kind of more of a, um, you know, progressive rock song. Um, some jazz influences here and there, and a ballads. It's a little bit of everything, uh, but it's well done and I enjoy the whole album. 
Um, but like I said, I think like a lot of bands from this time, they were suffering a bit from identity crisis. Well, I'm not sure what's going on back there with the band photo. Look like they're wearing their pajamas or something. At least a couple of them are. Uh, yeah, this one here, I, I, I don't, I don't know. You have to, it was the '70s, drugs. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, solid album from Max Webster. Um, I really, really like their first album, the best of all their albums. Um, and Universal Juveniles and was their last album, I believe. Uh, I love that album as well. Uh, but it's a good album as well. Mutiny Up My Sleeve, definitely worthy of being in this list at number seven. At uh, number six, uh, as this album I've had for uh, a couple years now, um, this is Gatto. Who cares? Full title. If indeed it is lonely at the top, who cares? It's lonely at the bottom too. <laughs> This band definitely had a, uh, a sense of humor to their music, and um, I don't know if that hurt them or helped them. Um, they were kind of sleazy too. They they're, had this kind of sleazy vibe, um, you know, that kind of sleaze metal stuff that we got in the '80s. You know, this is like a kind of a precursor to that, and, and I'm sure they don't get credit for that at all. Uh, once again, this is another band that really didn't see a whole lot of success outside of Canada, um, which is unfortunate because they're definitely a good band. Um, Greg Godovitz, Godovitz. Uh, who was the bassist and one of the main players in this band. They were a, a power trio along with uh, Gino Scarpelli and Doug Inglis, Inglis on drums. Um, but uh, here, let me just read a couple of the song titles to you. Um, so you got Cock On, and uh, let's see, we got uh, O'Carroll, um, Kiss My Whip. So, you know, you, you kind of get that the, the sleazy vibe that this one had. Um, and my favorite song in here is uh, Too Much Carousing, which is a, which is a fantastic song but uh, Oh Carol Kiss My Whip is a great song too um, it's definitely one of the more memorable songs from this band um, and the song apparently was written about Carol Pope um, from the band Rough Trade and uh, I, I don't know the whole story behind that or if it was a joke or or if this had some kind of feuding I don't know maybe one of you guys from Canada can tell me more about that one but great song um, a lot of fun um, some goofy stuff on here intentional goofy stuff on here um, definitely worthy of being at number six in this list Gatto who cares? All right, this next album, I had never heard of these guys until it arrived in the mail. And this is one that um, uh, Blackmore Rules, Greg the Egg, sent me just out of the blue. And uh, man, I really, really like this record. And it could have gone anywhere in this top five list because it's just that good. Um, this is uh, Hounds Unleashed. Now, this album, the cover kind of looks kind of like a punk cover or uh, maybe even an early metal cover, but it's not really either one of those. Um, uh, I actually wrote down what I, what I when I first heard this. What that, that kind of what I got? Greasy, sleazy '70s hard rock. That's kind of what I saw this as. Um, at its heaviest, um, it would rival you know '70s Aerosmith and Ted Nugent and uh, um, Rick Derringer. That kind of you know that guitar heavy rock and roll. Um, at its lighter moments, it, it kind of reminds me more of like uh, a T Rex. Um, that kind of glam '70s glam rock. Um, even like the first Bebop Deluxe record, um, kind of in that area right there. Mata Hoople, kind of like that. Uh, super catchy songs on this album. You know, every song is you're, you're going to end up singing along to. Um, at least that's the way I saw it. And I've played this record, I've only had this record for less than a year, and I've played it 10, 12 times, um, which is saying a lot because I do have a lot of records. So, um, really, I think this album was a precursor to pop metal. Um, you know, Guns N' Roses, uh, even the, kind of that sleazy sound, uh, Faster Pussycat, all those kind of L.A. sleaze bands. This was a precursor to that kind of thing. Really good record. Very heavy, too, for its time. Um, definitely not metal. I wouldn't call it metal, but it's good, solid, hard rock. All right, now we're into... Oh, that was our top... That was number five, so we're into our top five. Hounds. Hounds. Next up, we're going to do... Ah, this ne these next... Four. I had a really hard time, and I, I juggled them around three or four times which one I was going to put number one, two, three, and four. Because all these records I love, all of them I've known. This is bands that I've known for a long time and I've liked for a long time. But this is April Wine First Glance. This is the US pressing. Still looking for a copy of the Canadian cover. I haven't found one at a decent price in good shape. Um, this is definitely one of those albums that was played at parties a lot. Not only in Canada, but also in the United States, because every copy you see is just tore up. <laughs> I mean, you have beer bottle stains on it and cigarette burns and, you know, wicked ring wear. This one's a decent shape. Um, this is actually one that was given to me by uh, a VC member whose name is Vince. Um, but, yeah, just a great record. Side one alone could be just, uh, you know, April Wine's greatest hits. 
Um, so you got songs like "Get Ready for um, Get Ready for Love," which is the first song on here. Uh, heavy guitar rocker um, would you know would rival guys like Rick Derringer and Pat Travers, and um, you know just that heavy guitar rock and roll. I love that song. Um, it has kind of a Ted Nugent vibe, actually. That's kind of what it reminds me of. Uh, let's see, number two, "Hot on the Wheels." Killer track with some slide guitar. Kind of has that uh, '70s boogie uh, vibe, kind of like Heavy Fog Hat. Um, another great song, and if it wasn't released as a single, it should have been released as a single. Um, Rock and Roll, The Vicious Game, was is the ballad on the album. Strange name for a ballad. It's not really your typical, you know, s sappy love ballad, though. It's um, kind of a bluesy rocker um, with harp, you know, harmonica playing in it. Uh, it's a cool song. I actually like it. I'm not a huge, you know, ballads guy, but I do like that ballad. Uh, and then the last song on side one is Roller, and that's definitely the... Uh, probably the biggest hit on this record. Um, that is one that, at least here where I live, um, it still gets played on local radio. Um, when I'm working out at the gym and they got their rock, classic rock radio station on, I still hear Roller, Frank Wine getting played once in a while. Uh, good, just a solid rock and roll, heavy rock and roll record. Probably one of April Wine's best. I think by this point they just really found their sound. Um, and then they followed this album up with just a monster in Nature of the Beast. So. All right, next up, what do we have next? Uh, top three. Number three. Number three sat at number one for a while. <laughs> and I had a hard time um, pulling it down to number three, but I couldn't pull number two down to number three. So um, this is Frank Marino, Mahogany Rush Live. Five studio albums preceded this, and those albums I love. But there's something about this record. You know, as a young headbanger in the 80s, they, something about this record, it just had that heaviness. Um, Frank was, you know, part of that Lieber Krebs, Lieber Krebs uh, group who uh, also managed guys like Ted Nugent and Hart and uh, Cheap Trick, I think, and Ted Nugent, uh, you know, all those kind of heavier rock bands that were touring around and filling up stadiums in the 70s and the late 70s. Um, Frank was touring with those guys and was part of that group. And by this point, he had kind of taken that gotten away from the psychedelic stuff that he was influenced by in the late 60s and 70s and was playing super heavy guitar rock and that's what I love about this one. I know Frank's not too a big fan of this from what I've read. Um, unfortunately two of the biggest songs on this record um, were Johnny Be Good and Purple Haze, both cover songs. Uh, you know, all right, I love Purple Haze, I think the version here is awesome, but I just as much like his original material, if not more so than the covers. Never been a big fan of Johnny Be Good, but actually this song is very good on here. Uh, worthy of being at number three and like I said could have made number one for me I've listened to this album hundreds of times since I was a kid love it Frank Marino Mahogany Rush number two might be a shocker that's not number one knowing my affection for this band in the 70s but this is Rush Hemispheres um, now this band was definitely known in the US one of the bands that did escape from Canada and made it worldwide a huge band even today um, progressive very progressive here. Um, you got, you know, what some people would call masturbatory songs, because this, I mean, song number one is all of side one, and it's 18, just over 18 minutes long. Um, so I, I can never pronounce the name of this song. Cygnus X. Cygnus X. Um, and it's, yeah, 18 minutes and 7 seconds. That's a long song, but it's a great song. I love it. Um, side two had a hit on it. Um, the Trees, which I still hear quite frequently on the radio here in uh, where I live in New Mexico. Um, so he had some so sewer songs on side too, but even that, he had La Via Stran Strangiado? Strangiado. La Vida, La Via Strangiado. I don't know. Sounds Spanish to me, I'm not Spanish. <laughs> which is almost a 10 minute song too, so very long songs, very progressive, great record from Rush. Uh, I don't think this is a fan favorite, you don't hear much about this album, but it is a classic record from them. And number one, one that you may be surprised is at number one. Um, but I played this. I played all these records in the last couple of days because I had some time at home just to listen to music, and so I just started digging them out and playing them. I hadn't heard some of these in a while, and uh, I've forgotten how much I love this record. Um, you know what? I'm gonna go flip the record over. Hang on one second. Okay, I'm back. Um, number one. Guitar heavy rock and roll from the Pat Travers band. Heat in the Street. Another one of those albums I've just owned since I was a kid. Played it over and over again. Um, funny cover art. Funny back cover art as well. Uh, but this is a guitar heavy. 
you know, I want to call it Wank Fest. Because <laughs> I think of Nugent when I think of this album. It's got that kind of same heavy vibe. You know, he's almost beaten Nugent at his own game here. Um, just super heavy rock and roll. Uh, favorite songs, Killer Instinct. Uh, it's a brilliant song. Hammerhead. Uh, and the title track, Heat in the Street. There's really not a bad song on here. Um, mostly straightforward hard rock. Very, I think it was the very last song, one for me and one for you. Kind of has a little bit of a reggae feel. But that was one of the nice things about the 70s heavy metal bands and hard rock bands is they weren't confined to one sound. They weren't like, you know, oh, we have to sound like this. We can't try anything outside of this box. You know, these bands tried things out of the box. And uh, on this particular record, I think it worked great for Pat Travers. I've also pulled this out. Uh, this is a promo record on red vinyl that they released in 78 as well, Pat Travers. Um, we got one, two, three, four, five song promo release. Uh, just a cool thing that they sent out the radio stations with with a, a song from each of the albums uh, and a short little bio in the back, kind of trying to promote Pat Travers at the time. Uh, great record. Didn't really get a whole lot of radio play, unfortunately. Um, he was getting some, you know, some radio play with some some of his stuff in the past, but not with this album that I'm aware of. Um, you've got a couple of uh, well-known guys on this record. You've got uh, guitarist Pat Thrall. Um, who was a vital part of the Pat Travers band, um, also playing guitar, so you get some of those heavy riffs from him as well as Pat. Uh, but then also there is um, the drummer with the biggest hair ever, even here, before the hair metal days. Uh, there he is. So you got uh, there's Tommy Aldridge, who of course went on to be with Ozzy Osbourne and White Snake and Ted Nugent, among many others he's played with. And uh, also you got uh, Mars Calling on bass guitar. Um, like I said, fantastic, straightforward, guitar, heavy, rock and roll record, um, just brilliant. It's, it's one of those records that I put on and uh, I just, you know, I, I start bopping around to, playing air guitar to, it's just that good. Deserving of my number one list of the 1978 hard rock releases from Canada. So, Pat Travers, Heat in the Street, that's it, that's my top ten list. Uh, let me know what you think, uh, especially you people from Canada who know this stuff probably better than I do. Um, you know, I'm sure there's some stuff I might have missed out on, which is great, because if I did, let me know about it, because that's how you learn about new bands, and that's what I like about you guys, because you let me know. <laughs> uh, so anyhow, that's it. Thumbs up if you liked it. Thumbs down if you didn't. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. God bless. Stay strong.